We'll make a start. Um, just wanted to read a couple of verses here from John chapter 1, just to put us in frame of mind. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness, came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gave light to every man coming into the world. Let's just bow our heads and just commit our time to the Lord. <clears throat> Lord, we do indeed just commit this time, Lord, the reading of your word, the singing, the praise, the whole thing, Lord, that it would be indeed acceptable to you. And again, Lord God, when you draw near to us, Lord, you know each one of us, Lord, better than we know ourselves. And Lord, we just ask you to still our hearts for the next while that we can concentrate on you, Lord, and just leave the cares and whatever else is bugging us, Lord, at the door. And Lord, we do just commit this to you, Lord, and we ask you for a blessing. We ask you for your hand in us. And again, Lord, we just commit this time to you in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we return, just look at a few verses here in God's Word. I just wanted to read a couple... And Sam, or sorry, Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The Lord Jesus said that. But the verse I wanted to look at this morning is from the Song of Songs 2, 16. Now there's many and varying opinions on the Song of Songs. I heard a few of them there because I, I was just looking it up. It was the verse that actually struck me. My beloved is mine and I am his. And that beloved part, the fact that he is mine and I am his, I take that as the Lord Jesus. So I just wanted to look at the word beloved. I actually looked up the biblical meaning of beloved, which is quite interesting. In the Old Testament, the word beloved is used repeatedly in the Song of Solomon um, as the newlyweds express their deep affection for each other. And then in Nehemiah 13, 26, the word beloved is used to describe King Solomon as beloved by his God. In fact, at Solomon's birth, because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah, which means loved by the Lord. And again, for reasons known only to him, God sets special affection on some people and uses them in greater ways than he uses others. He uses, I'm oh, sorry, Israel is often called beloved of God. In the Old Testament, you see it there in Deuteronomy 33, 12, Jeremiah 11, 15. And God shows this people group as his beloved in order to set them apart for his divine plan to save the world through Jesus. We know the, we know the story of that. Again, it's in the New Testament as well, the word beloved. Many New Testament writers use the word beloved to address the recipients of their letters. Examples are Philippians 4 verse 1, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, and 1 Peter 2 11. And seemingly, most of the time, the Greek word translated beloved is agapetoi, if I'm pronouncing that right. It's related to the word agape, which we probably all have heard of, even if we're not Greek scholars or whatever. In the inspired letters, beloved means friends dearly loved by God. In the New Testament, the use of the word beloved implies more than human affection. I mean, I love my wife, my kids, but this is more than that. This is a way, way more than that. It suggests an esteem for others that comes from recognising their worth 
as children of God. And I think the last time I was up here, I was talking about the word that we're precious jewels, that we're worth something to the Lord, even though when I'm standing there, and you take a look in the mirror, you think, well, what do you see that's worth anything? But the Lord sees it. Um, those addressed were more than friends. They were brothers and sisters in Christ and therefore highly valued. And you know, it just struck me, we sometimes don't value one another enough. We kind of take it for granted and we can be snarky and maybe not like everybody in the, whatever you know yourself, but brothers and sisters in Christ are highly valued before the Lord and each one of us should. We're supposed to be known by our love for one another. The world is running around taking the legs out from underneath one another. I see it where I work. People are friends and best friends. They are not because they're talking about everybody else behind their back and they're cutting the legs. That's what the world does. But anyway, I'm kind of going off, off uh, tangent here. Since Jesus is the one whom God loves, beloved is also used as a title for Christ. Paul speaks of how believers are the beneficiaries of God's glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved, in Ephesians 1 verse 6. The Father loves the Son, and he loves and blesses us for the Son's sake. He sees us through, the, through Jesus. He covers us, the blood covers us. But anyway, all those adopted into God's family through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ are beloved by the Father. In, and John 1.12 will speak about that. And Romans 8.15 touches on that. It's an amazing, lavish love. See what great love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are when we're saved. This isn't speaking to everybody. Actually, there, what was it? There was some kind of an old comedy thing on years ago. Or it could have been on the radio. And your man kept saying, Ah, oh, we're all children of God. That's not true. Some are children of the devil. Some are children of God. You have to be saved to be a child of God. You have to be brought into his family. If you're not in his family, well, the alternative is the other. Um, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, see what she... Uh, Sorry. Because God has shed his love on us, we are free to apply the words of the Song of Solomon to our relationship with Christ. I am my beloved Christ, and my beloved Christ is mine. Now I'm paraphrasing that, I'm adding in. But that's the verse I wanted to look at. And just as I was looking at that, I was looking at verses kind of tied in with it. Beloved, yes, we've looked at that, we've seen what that means, this, or well, means. But what does it mean to us, actually, personally? Is he your beloved today? Do you know him as your saviour? I mean, it raised, you know, it raised a few thoughts in my head during the week there as I was looking at this, because when I, this verse came up and I was looking at it and thought, what? I'm not going to mention Song of Songs, because obviously it's, some people find it, uh, they keep away from it. But I just looked at that beloved and I thought, yeah, is he mine? Ask that question yourself, is he yours? Again, in Leviticus 26, 12, it speaks about, I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. Again, that's, there's a mention of that as well in Revelation 21, 2 and 3, and I'll be going to that, or that's, I would mark down here further. But just to look at the Lord Jesus as the beloved, that's what I'm trying to do really, just look at him where it's spoken about him being beloved and then we look at just ourselves and people what it says about us so mark 1 11, and there came a voice from heaven saying thou art my beloved son in whom i am well pleased that was the lord almighty speaking about his son jesus in matthew 17 5 this was when they were up in the mountain and the transfiguration occurred while he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, when some of the versions say, Listen to him, pay attention to him, 
he's got something to say, he's got something to tell us. And what he says is, come to me and be saved. He said there that he would draw all men unto himself. And his father said that very thing, listen to my son. That was obviously recorded and written down for our benefit, two th- or whatever it is, yeah, 2,000 years later. Just moving on again to Luke 20, 13, there was a parable told, the Lord Jesus told this to the people. It's the parable of the vineyard. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. And again, I was just thinking there, there wasn't that much reverence for the Lord Jesus when he came. He was put upon by the religious people, the people that should have known better, and make no mistake, they did know who he was. Because I was reading there recently, and these, these so-called uh, church leaders, the synagogue lads, they knew exactly who he was. But they chose not to accept him. And they went further than that. They handed him over to the Romans and had him crucified. And the same two in Acts, when the apostles were speaking out, they knew exactly that these men were saying. What they were saying was right. They were uneducated men. They were basically the dregs of society generally, although you had some from higher up the scale. But they couldn't have spoke the way they did without the Spirit of God being upon them. And it was the Spirit of God speaking through them. But these folks knew. And they didn't reverence them. In John 3, 35 and 36, it says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God <coughs> excuse me, abides on him. Again, the question, do you know him as Saviour? Because, you know, God hates sin. He cannot look on sin. He cannot be dealing with, with sin. The plain fact is that if you don't know the Lord Jesus and if you haven't got everlasting life, the wrath of God abides in you. I don't know what state you're, you're here this morning. You don't know what state I'm in. But the plain fact is we have a choice. You're either saved or unsaved. Now, coming to people and folks that have been called beloved. We saw there already, <coughs> excuse me, that Solomon was called beloved. He was loved by the Lord. In Deuteronomy 33, 12, and of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him. And the Lord shall cover him all the day long and he shall dwell between his shoulders. And that was blessings for the different tribes. And obviously, This was about Benjamin, but I was just thinking that can be applied to us. The word of God generally can be applied right across the board. Now, there are some things that are purely specific, but as I was looking at this, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety and the Lord shall cover him. Yeah, the Lord will cover us. We will dwell in safety. Sure enough, we have things to deal with. Some of our our brothers and sisters are not well. Some are extremely unwell, but the Lord's hand is upon them. And he shall dwell between his shoulders. It just reminded me of, of there's, I think there's a picture or a, a painting of someone carrying a sheep in their shoulders. And that's exactly what I thought of. He carries us. We're weak. I mean, this week as I was doing this, I literally was hearing what hair I have out. And it's just, I, I think I said that to John there yesterday, just when I just, I gave up and I said, Lord, help me. Oh, I can't be doing this. What strength have I? I'm weak. I'm miserable. I can hardly string two words together. But the Lord, he's my strength. And again, if you don't know him, you can have that strength too. As I said earlier there, I wouldn't be here only for him. I don't know where I'd be, but I certainly wouldn't be here sitting in a church building trying to do this. In Isaiah 51, 16, I have put my words in thy mouth I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Again, covering us, he shields us in the shadow of his hand. Thou art my people. And again, it's speaking to Zion. But we can apply this to us. 
Thou art my people, we are beloved. In Psalm 48, 14, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. And I just wrote Job at the end of that because I think oh, I was out on the bike recently and I was listening to Job. I have these yokes that they go outside your ears and you can actually hear them. They're, they're right handy pair of kind of headphones and you can hear everything around you but I was able to I tell myself there I've got these why don't I just listen to the word of God because I could be out for an hour or two and just yeah something something will go into the head surely I hear something and I have bits and pieces have hit me that oh I didn't realize that but someone said there the debt and taxes are the only thing that are sure well not with the taxes but debt is certainly sure Job knew that he lost his whole family he lost everything he had it was just like that, gone. He went from being a rich man with a, a fine family to nothing, mm. sitting in the dirt, scratching himself with a, a bit of a pot. In Psalm 63, actually, sorry, I just want to look at Psalm 49. There's just a few verses there that ties in with that. And it just struck me. Psalm 49, verses 6 and 7 it says those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches none of them by, can by any means redeem his brother well money won't redeem you nor will man because someone said before there about converts he said there that if there were my converts to be in serious trouble you will converted only by the Lord and by the Holy Spirit Um. None of them can, verse 7, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemptions of their soul, or sorry, for the redemption of their souls is costly and it shall cease forever. And then just moving on to verse 10. For he sees wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish as well and leave their wealth to others. In verse 11, their inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. And I've seen this. I've seen people that they think they're... They, oh, I'm actually amazed. They actually think they're going to live for... I don't know how long they think they're going to live, but they make a humongous amount of money. They're very successful. And it might be that, it could be just family, it can be different things, mm. but that's their God. Mm. But they think that they're going to have this forever. Mm. Three score and ten. Maybe three score and twenty. Mm. You'll even get the odd one hits a hundred or a little over a hundred. But you'll go just the same. Right. And if the Lord comes back, if you're saved, he'll take you up. Mm. It's one or the other. Like there's no way out of this place, as someone said. Um... Or sorry, there's only one way out of this place, but there is two, technically. And in verse 14, again, Psalm 49, 14. Like sheep that are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, far from their dwelling. And in verse 15, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. When I read that, I take that speaking about the saved. The unsaved and the saved will go into the grave. Mm -hmm. But one will rise to be with the Lord. The other will rise up to judgment, be judged. And there's only one way then. That's a way with Satan and his minions. But it just struck me like the, the seriousness of it. Do you know the Lord is your saviour this morning? If you don't, Please, when you're sitting in the chair, deal with the Lord. Ask him. He's, he's looking for you. In Psalm 63, 1, it says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. Are you seeking him? And even for us that know him, we need to be seeking him every day. It struck me that early I will seek thee. You know, sometimes I get up real early in the morning, and the first thing I'll do is I'll read a couple of chapters, and I like, I'm going through Psalms at the moment, and I'm going through the New Testament, I mean Acts as well. But you know what? It's a, it's a push on to you because if you don't do it then you kind of go on and you're doing something else and you, I'm sure you know that as well and just have a word of prayer and just commit yourself to the Lord 
instead of jumping out of the bed and taking off and doing something. Because my temptation is always, the mind is whirring and I think, oh, I should do this, 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 and I'll take off and do it. Sure. I'm at nothing. I'm catching up all day long. And when I stop and go to the Word of God, does it stop me? Does, does, does it make a difference to my day? Yes. And I'm not playing catch up. The Lord, I keep thinking, there, the Lord, is, he's a halt of time. He can sort things out for me during the day and I can get all that I want to do. But anyway. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And I straight away thought, oh, they're talking about the world. The world is one dry, thirsty, tough spot. And again, actually during the week, I saw some video to some minister, or supposed minister of the gospel, praying. They were reading some prayer out of a book. Well, if it wasn't Mark Central, I, I've never heard a prayer like this before. This is, I, because of the, the heading of the video, I had to have a look, of course. But this person was talking about God as God, the father, the mother, the whatever, the thou, you know, all these pronouns. They also took the, the what you call the rainbow, but they applied it to something that it wasn't. And I just thought, oh my heavens, this one is supposed to be a minister in a church setting, and this is what they're doing? What hope have they in, folks? They have no hope. Unless the Lord breaks in and saves them, because they certainly won't hear it from their minister. I mean, it's scary. I mean, that's the one thing here. We're reading the Word of God. Don't mind what I say. I, I can blather away nonsense. And I can talk away. But pay attention. Like, like that verse said there. Listen to Jesus. And to him alone. If what I say agrees and is right. Fair enough. But if it isn't. Toss it out. It's only rubbish. And that one that prayed there. It was rubbish. It needs the bin. They need to be canned. They shouldn't be inside in a building with people. But Anyway. We'll move on. Again, it says there about a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Streams of living water are found in Jesus. You know, there's verses in different places about that. I think, I think it's in the Psalms as well about streams of living water. In John, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, it basically tells us, do not love the world. We're stuck in the world, but... And we have to operate in it, but do not love it. Sometimes we get too tied in with it. Well, I do. Sometimes I get too taken up with stuff. I would be a great and for law and order and for taking out the government and hanging the lot of them and setting up something proper. But it's not my place. The Lord has put them in place. He'll deal with it. My business is to tell people about Jesus. And if I spent a little more time in that, or a lot more time in that, and a lot less carping about the state of things, I'd be better off. But anyway, going on to 1 Corinthians 3.21. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is, Christ is God's. So if we're in Christ, we're actually part of the Lord Almighty God. We're not just a brother of Christ, as we're told in the priest. We are sons of the Most High God. And trust that no man glory in men. Too many people are following this one and following that one. and Even in the church settings, they're following preachers. I mean, it's starting to come out about a lot of these well-known preachers. They ain't too hot. They've been doing stuff in the background there and they haven't repented. If they had repented, fair enough, but they haven't repented. Some have even died without repenting. Every day we need to, I think as Doug said it there before, if you're out in the field and you think of something, get in your knee. Repent. And I always figure that's good advice. Don't always follow it. But it is really good advice. Get on your knee and ask for forgiveness. Actually, I think Job was doing that when his sons and daughters had these feasts. He'd come before the Lord and he was offering a sacrifice for them and kind of trying to take their guilt in case they had cursed the name of God, I think it was, that I read or heard. But anyway, it put me in mind as well. There's a hymn 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Good advice as well. Lean on Jesus. In Jeremiah 31, 33, it tells us, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And I was just thinking, yeah, when we're saved, that's exactly, that law, it's written in our hearts. We know right from wrong. Before, I was just thinking there during the week, before I was saved, I'd done stuff there and I thought, oh, right, it's not great. But my conscience got seared and the more I done, the more I felt I could get away with it and the more I done again and eventually I just didn't see anything wrong. But now, as a follower, when I sometimes get car- or narky with someone or say something stupid, you actually think about this and you think, oh, that's a sin. The Lord is not pleased with this. And I'm just, I'm sure that you, you're the same. We do things, we say things, and we don't do things sometimes that we should do. And yes, the Holy Spirit pokes us. If you're not saved, you don't see this. Everything is permissible. Everything is great. Again, going to Galatians 2.20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, it's turning us to Jesus. John 10.11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, and again, it's a precious life. The precious Son of God, that beloved in 1 Peter 1 8, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Yes, we're rejoicing, even through trials. And as I said, there's a lot of people not well, some fairly bad, but they'll tell you that they have a joy. They know where they're going. And again, having not seen him, Yet we love him. Can you say that in your heart this morning, that you love Jesus? Like I said, as I went down through this, I'll tell you, I got a fair good, what would you call it, scotching from the Holy Spirit to kind of cop on. You need to look at this. I felt this was kind of pointing at me quite, quite a lot. But again, as I say there, I don't think people are that much different. I'm sure that some of these words are speaking to you. And again, if you don't know him, you need to get to know him. You need him as your saviour. In John 10, 28, 29 and 30, And I give unto them eternal life, that they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And it just struck me, this is the unchanging Lord. What he says, he does. And again, I'll say it again. Every word in this book, you can believe. Anything you hear on Sky News or the rest of them, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Every time you pick up a newspaper, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Sure. As a reporter, if you have a certain agenda, you can push people and get them to say things they never said. But the word of God, try twisting that around and see where you'll end up. We're warned not to change it. We're warned not to mess with it. We're blessed if we read it, but there's a curse in those that take it and change it. But it's the only book we can, it's the only thing that we can actually believe. It's truth. In Revelation, 21, 2 and 3. Again, that was tied in with Leviticus 26, 12 earlier, where it speaks about, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And I was just thinking there, will the Lord actually be walking around in heaven when we're there? Uh, We'll be kind of there in front of him. I don't know. But I'm assuming that's the case, that we will be so close to the Lord. And the Lord Jesus, we're told, is the light. 
And again, just let's remember that that our, our destination is not the grave, our destination is beyond. Because when we're in the valley, or on the mountain here, and sometimes we're in between halfways up and halfways down, this is the unchanging Lord. The Lord is with men and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Again, he's talking about the saved. If you're not saved, this ain't happening. You're with the other guy, with Satan. And it's not going to be funny. And there's no pleasure to be got out of that. He will be there, your God. And again, that just came from the beloved. Jesus is our beloved. My beloved is mine, and I am his. If you can say that today, praise the Lord. If you can't, please as I said already, quietly come before the Lord and ask him to save you. Ask him to, to let you know that, that he is your beloved, he is your saviour. Now we're going to finish. I just want to, to just commit it to prayer first, Carrie, but we're going to sing a hymn, I am his and he is mine. I forgot to write down the number, of course, needless to say. It's 506. Oh, good man yourself. I'm hopeless. Anyway, let's just bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you for the verses that we read. Your word, Lord, it stands, it's unchanging, and we just thank you and praise you for it, Lord. And again, Lord God, as we just sing this hymn, Lord, if there's anybody in here who does not know you, Lord, will you draw, your, draw them unto yourself, Lord? We know that you're seeking them. And Lord, maybe they're touched by the Holy Spirit, a bit like Paul, Lord, that even though he was fighting against you, Lord, you were touching the whole time, you were poking like a, with a stick. So, Lord, we just ask you, in the name of Jesus, Lord, to do that. And we just commit this to you and thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.